and welcome. Let's turn in our handles. It's a 271. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. None else could heal all our soul's diseases. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Let's stand and sing together. Two, seven, one. thank you for your son Jesus Christ who took upon himself the form of a ser servant and became and came in the likeness of men. We thank you Lord for the, the humility that our Savior showed so that he through his life could save us. We praise you Lord for your word. We praise you Lord for how you have even worked in our lives today. I pray that you'd help us to listen and to obey in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Be seated. 276. 276. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. 276.
All right, as we come to the uh, last night of our services, this is our last offering we're going to be taking. And um, it's just the opportunity to be able to show how much you appreciate Brother Pelletier for being here. And all that comes in tonight and uh, the last two nights will go directly to him. And this is to help offset his uh, cost and to send him with a love gift uh, when he leaves here uh, tomorrow. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening that you've given to us again. For allowing us to be in your house, Lord, we just ask that you would be with the offering. Please help it meet the needs uh, for Brother Pelletier and ask that you would be blessed both the gift and the giver in your name. Amen. 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 Tori heard her practice in it and she uh, did a really good job both times she I said play me something I was at their house for supper and she said well I could spoil the offertory and um, I liked it both times so now uh, tonight is uh, of course the last night of this series of meetings but um, probably we'll be back sometime in the future and uh, glad to be down here this time. There are a few people here I've not met yet. Um, you want to introduce your dad? Yeah, uh, it's your dad. Okay. <laughs> hey, Dad. <laughs> Good to have you. And then behind you, is this your sister? Yeah, hi. Oh, hello. Is this your first time here? Oh, were you here last night? Why not? No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> okay, I'm only kidding. You. We thought family night was today. Oh, you thought it was tonight. Well, originally it was, but the evangelist messed it all up and changed everything on you. But uh, tonight you can be friends, adopted, but you can be friends for your son, okay? All right, so uh, so you've got behind you your friend, and then you go to school here, don't you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> now, what's your name? Abigail. Abigail, you're Abigail. Okay, yeah, she's uh, my friend. She's your friend. Uh, you don't have any friends. No. Yeah, you do. You got, you got all kinds of friends. Okay. I know I'm one of them. I know I'm one of them. So good. Good, good. All right. Well, anyway, um, then you guys, good to see you guys up here in the front row. And uh, your your mom is here. No? Yeah? Yes. Yeah, I thought so. And then 
your mom is binded. No. Is it? Okay, you go. Okay, all right. Okay. Keep an eye on him. Okay, all right. Well, so good to have everybody here and thankful for you being out tonight. But we are doing a little contest for one of the most friends here. Yes. Also, I have another friend coming, but he's like almost here. When's he going to get here? Okay, you can count him as if it's going to be there, okay? So, what we're going to do is if you brought a friend or more, uh, we'll have you just kind of, we normally have you stand your feet. I think there are like two, but let's have both of you stand. So, if you brought a friend or more, and you can count your mom and your dad and everybody in your group, you can be the man, okay? All right, so stand up if you've got at least one friend almost coming here, almost here, okay? And then, uh, all right. So, did you bring a friend? All right, and uh, good to have you here. Great. Now, um, you go to the school here too, right? And you were here like last night? No, no. on Monday. Oh, Monday night, okay. Well, we had a great time on Monday, and really glad that you are here again. So great, thank you. So you've got one friend with you, that's outstanding. How about you? Uh, me? I have <laughs> Three friends. Uh, are you going to count your sister? Yes. She's not here. Three. Okay, you're going to. Abigail doesn't count. Wait, so me? No. Okay, so we'll give you three. We'll give you three. All right. All right. And then you've got. I have one coming. Her home, so. <laughs> Might as well count Abigail. It's one, one for you. She couldn't be here because you're taking her home. All right, so we'll count out the other. Did you have your brother and your mom? Yeah, my brother. And your mom. Yeah, I'm not that guy. My mom was here too. Ah, oh, you threw a monkey wrench in there. So here's what we'll do. Since both of you have so many, we're going to let both of you go by the table if you want afterwards and, and pick out a nice uh, painting either for your room or for your mom or something, okay? And then uh, we sure think you did a great job inviting people. And then since you brought a visitor tonight, you can go by and get a painting too, okay? So all three of you can do it. But let's give them a hand for doing such a good job. You're the man. You're the man. Good job. All right. You can see it. All right. Well, wonderful. And um, thank you very much. We'll continue. Uh, let's turn in our hymnals to 244 for friend night. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Let's stand. Let's sing 244. 244. <laughs>
Well, thank you for singing. And uh, I thought maybe being the last night here, um, we uh, we have a good number of people here. We're able to be out here a lot this week. And some of you, this is your first time. And uh, uh, trust that maybe this week's been a blessing to you. We've had a good time in the school. And we've had a good time um, even in the evenings. Um, and just have enjoyed it. Uh, look forward to getting with y'all again. Um, let's go ahead and just see if anybody has a brief word of testimony. It won't take long, but a brief word of testimony is something that's done in your life, maybe through the meeting in school or maybe at night. And if nobody wants to share a testimony, it's okay. Uh, kids in the school, some are going to do it maybe next week, but maybe somebody might want to tonight. Anybody like that at all? Just uh, how many would say God spoke to your heart, even if you don't say a testimony? Nod your hand, head, or raise your hand or something. Amen. Good. So, um, anybody want to share briefly something that God's done in your life? If you're not too shy, it might be a blessing to somebody. Anyone? Okay. Why don't we start there? Go ahead. You can just stand right there. Or... Uh, um, just kind of with the messages here, I've been really thankful. I pray for me to just, uh, like to fix more things that I need to fix, and then just that I'm able to bring God. That's great. Wonderful. Amen. Thank you. Anybody else you want to share something briefly? Sometimes testimonies are like popcorn. You get one that goes pop, and then another one a little bit later, pop, and then before long you got pop, 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 and then they start coming. But we don't want to force it. Uh, but God has done some good things. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'd just like to say that this school has been a blessing for us. We had to deal with a lot with Michael in the public school. And um, it took, had taken a toll on all of us. I think it took, a, took me away from the Lord for just a little bit because I was upset. And just to see the way that they were. And then we came here and it's just been such a blessing to us. The church, the people, they're just, it's like a family actually. So this, this school has been a blessing. To our Amen for that. Thank the Lord for those who who, who work to make the school Amen. and put themselves into it. That's a blessing. Amen. Thanks for sharing that. Anybody else has something you want to say? Share. I can cut my sermon short. I did it once. <laughs> yes, sir, Brother Tim. Um, you know, I was just thinking about your Sunday school lesson on Sunday and how you just kept emphasizing the, the love of Christ and how you said, you know, we love him because he first loved us. And it just reminds me that, you know, a lot of times that that's what we have to do as, as Christians is that we have to love someone in order for them to, to reciprocate, you know, and many times that's just what people are looking for. Um, I know we talked last night that, I think our young people are just are looking for truth and the best way to help them to find truth is just to show hey there is a Christ that loves you and wants to know you and there's nothing there's no lies about him everything that's true about Christ is 100% and he'll never leave you or forsake you amen it's great absolutely we love him because he first loved us in other words, uh, because God loved us, we love him. And if you uh, want to have a friend, you've got to be a friend. A man of that friends must show himself friendly. So that's in line with that. And then uh, I had a girl come to me and said, my dad uh, doesn't seem to care about me at all. And I said, well, as a dad, he should care about you. He should start it. But if he doesn't, we love Christ because he first loved us. So if you will show love, usually it'll come back to you. And I say, just go out of your way to be everything you can to show your dad you genuinely love him. And he should be the adult. He should be the one showing it to you. But if not, you show it to him and see if maybe it'll come back. And it did. And that love produces love. That's good. Good. Anybody else? All right. Well... Let's take our Bibles and thank you for sharing those testimonies and let's stand together out of respect for God's word. And then we're going to go ahead and uh, have a word of prayer and then I'll announce the text, okay?
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have again to be together. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for what you've done in this week of meetings. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us, Lord, this evening as we look into your word. We pray, Lord, that you would guide to the message that we all need, something that would help us all and speak to my heart as well as every heart that's here. And we pray, Lord, for the Holy Spirit to accomplish and complete the work that's needed here tonight. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, remain standing, if you will, for just a second. And uh, let's go ahead and take our Bibles and let's turn to um, 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. And I'd like to begin reading at verse 1. 2 Peter 3, beginning at verse 1. The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, and both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? Thank you, and you can be seated. Years ago, I remember seeing a TV show and Hollywood was mocking the idea of Jesus and about Jesus ever coming to earth again. It was definitely mocking it. And the way that they mocked it is that they had uh, the sign in the churchyard with these words on it, Jesus is coming soon. And then it zoomed the camera to the backyard where people were drinking beer and things like that. Then he zoomed back in on the camera, Jesus is coming soon. And just then the wind blew and a letter from that sign dropped to the ground. And it was obviously Hollywood was saying, some preacher put that sign up there so long ago, Jesus is coming soon, that it's fallen apart. What a joke, Jesus is coming soon. Well, the Bible says that in the last days, as we talk about the Lord's return, people would say, no way, it's not going to happen. And they would scoff us and say, you're kind of a fool to really believe in that. But the Bible said that that would happen. But the Bible does say that Jesus is going to come back again. And what that means is that when he comes, then all our ability to do anything else for God is going to be done. Uh, there are two things that will end the possibility of us accomplishing any more work for God. One, if we die, we can't do anything else. But two, once Christ comes, all the labor that we do to try to help other people is over. So we've got to work while the night, uh, because the night comes when no man can work. But also, there might be some people here tonight that you don't know that you're going to go to heaven when you die. And when Jesus comes, the Bible says that if you're not a Christian, then you will go through what's called a tribulation period. And the tribulation period is the worst time ever on the earth, and it's a time of judgment because of sin. Now, I know it all sounds like something out of a science fiction movie as we get into it, but you'll see the Bible gives real good evidence for these things. And I want you to know that you need to be saved before Jesus comes back, if you're not saved. And so we're going to talk about Jesus' return and challenge you to take it very seriously tonight and let it motivate you and I who are saved and those that are not to take it seriously and to finally take care of business with God. Now, the first thing that I want to look at is the statement that Jesus made. He said, I will come again. Now, two things about this. First, it's a promise, okay? John 14, 3, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. So it was a promise that Jesus said. Now he left and he went to heaven and then he said he's going to come back again. And for us not to believe it is to call Jesus a liar. And I'm not going to do that. But there are many other passages, Acts 1, 11. When Jesus ascended up into heaven, the angel said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from ye into heaven, shall so come. In other words, he's going to come again. Hebrews 9, 28. 
Just so you know, the Bible promises it. We don't just pick a verse and make it up. It says, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Revelation 1, 7, behold, he cometh. Revelation 22, 7, behold, I come quickly. Revelation 22, 12, and behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me. And Revelation 22, 20, some of the last words of the whole Bible are even so come, Lord Jesus. Now, I just said a lot of Bible verses, but the idea is evidence. We're not making this up. The Bible clearly teaches that Jesus is going to come back to earth again. Now, first, it is a promise, and secondly, his program. Now, many people don't know that there are two parts or phases to Christ's return. Now, the first part is what we call the rapture. The second part, the revelation of Jesus. Let me explain. And those two places are, re are separated by the, the tribulation period, the seven-year tribulation. Now, first is the rapture, and the Bible says that Jesus is not going to come all the way down to the earth at this point. He's just going to come to the clouds. And at that moment, every one of us, this word sounds like a science fiction movie, who believes that Jesus is the Savior, and we've asked him to save us, will be caught up to meet Jesus in the clouds. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. It says, For the Lord himself shall descend, shall descend, not might, not maybe, shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now that may, again, be a very difficult thing for you to think about if you've never been in church much. But if you read the Bible and you can understand what is history in the Bible, it says that when Jesus was on earth, he literally in Acts chapter 1 was caught up into the sky. Now being he is God, that's a pretty easy thing for him to do. And then he is going to go down to the clouds one day very soon it's prophesied he'll take us up into the sky and take us out and then send judgment. Again, I'll give you evidences to show that it is not just talk. All right, now first is the rapture where we're taken out. And then after that, it's a seven year tribulation and the tribulation period will be like a hell on earth. And you don't want to go through the tribulation. Now, after the tribulation period, there'll be that revelation of Jesus. And this says that Jesus is literally going to come all the way down to the earth, Zechariah 14, 4, and land on Mount Olive. It's going to then be that he'll walk into Jerusalem and set up a thousand-year reign called the millennial reign of Jesus. And that will be a time of total peace on earth. There'll be no war. There'll be no, no death except for people that rebel against Jesus would end up dying, but very few people are even going to die in the tribulation period. It'll be a time of peace on earth, and after that, a few things take place and we go into eternity. But I wanted to make aware it is a promise, and his program is two phases. First, the rapture, and later, the revelation, separated by the tribulation period. Right, now, that's the statement that he made. Now, secondly, I want to look at the support for this statement. Now, why do we know that it's going to happen, and why do we believe it's going to happen very soon? And I say this because we need to understand that we're doing a job for God. We have to do what we can, as much as we can, because we really will run out of time to do something for God. And also, if you've not been saved, I want to show you there's evidence for this. We preach on hell, we preach on heaven, and there's evidence for that. But there's also evidence that the tribulation period is around the corner in the world, and if you're not born again, you will go through the tribulation. Now, first I want to give a valid argument why we believe it's going to happen and why we believe it'll be soon, and then we'll look at an invincible argument, okay? Now, the valid argument to why we believe Jesus is really coming soon. I first... There will be signs. 
Now turn in your Bibles to Luke 21, if you can find it. Luke 21, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then you can find Luke 21, Matthew, Mark, Luke, then John in the New Testament. Now somebody says there aren't going to be any signs before the Lord's return. Well, let's see what the Bible says in Luke 21 and verse 11. It says, And great earthquakes shall be in divers places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. So there will be signs. Now look at verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, Men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking on those things which are coming upon the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man, Jesus, coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, somebody says there will not be any signs before the Lord's return. The Bible says there will be signs. But here's the exciting thing. The signs are really not talking about before the rapture. They're talking about before the second part, the revelation. And so there'll be no warnings for the rapture. That could take place tonight. But there'll be many warnings before the second part, which is the revelation. And here's the exciting thing. Many of the things that are to precede the second part of this return are already starting to happen. For instance, I'll mention three. Turn in your Bibles over to Revelation 13, and that's the last book of the Bible, and some of you won't be able to follow it that quickly, but others of you will. Don't worry about it. If you can't get there, just stay along and listen the best you can. Now, Revelation 13 says three things that'll happen when the Antichrist comes. Now, how many of you have ever heard of the Antichrist? Okay, so three things will happen when the Antichrist comes. Number one, he is going to become a one world dictator. So there will be one world government. Now, where do we get that? Take a look at verse seven. And it was given unto him, the Antichrist, to make war with the saints and overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Now, A-L-L, -L, what does that spell? All. So it says every tongue, every nation, he will have power over all of them. So that's why preachers preach that there'll be this one world dictator in the tribulation. But if you're saved, you don't have to worry about it. You won't go through that. Okay? But those who are left behind will go through this. Now, there's a lot that has been developing, bringing us toward a one world government. I was in a meeting with some preacher friends of mine, even way back in 1998, and we were sitting there talking, one guy said, did you hear what happened yesterday? I said, no, what? He said, 160 nations sent representatives to a certain location to discuss forming a one world government. I said, you're just looking for preaching material. I'm not gonna believe that just because you said it. I'm gonna check it out for myself. Wouldn't that make sense? So I did, and sure enough, it did happen. So they sent 160 nations and they said, we've got to have a one world court in order to stop genocide, war crimes, hunger, and all of these horrible things going on in the world. So then I watched them as they said, we need to get a constitution and we'll consider it world law. And I watched, they said, when 60 nations ratify it, and they will be willing to put their sovereign nation under the power of the higher Constitution, the international constitution, then we will consider it world law. And if people won't go along with it, well, we'll just enforce it with our military might. Now, I watched on April 11, 2002, when the 65th nation ratified it. And so in July of that year, it became world law. And then, as of last month, there are 130 nations that have joined. Now, you can look it up. I'm not making it up. I don't care how strong the United States is. I don't think that we could stand against 130 nations at one time. There's a lot going on that we're not aware of. Now, here's the amazing thing. 2,000 years ago, in case you kind of wonder, is there anything to the Bible? 2,000 years ago, it said that there would be a one world government. 
And you know where it said it would come from? Revelation 17, 9, we'll look at it in a little bit, but it says the city that has seven mountains. Now, people have been saying that that, let's go ahead and look at it because I see people can turn there. So let's turn there, Revelation 17, 9. Here is the mind which hath wisdom or discernment. The seven heads, which is a picture of the one world government, that's another sermon, but the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. So that is saying, this is where that seven head one world government is going to come from. And that has been identified way back in 134 AD by historians to be the city of Rome. So for years and years and years, preachers have been preaching. Rome. Keep your eyes on Rome. There'll be a one world government in the end days. It'll come out of the city of Rome. Now, do you know where they met July 17th, 1998? The city of Rome. And do you know what they're calling the constitution for the world? They are calling it the statutes of Rome. Now, what this is, is an indication of this that at least it appears that God is wrapping up this thing called the world, and the church age, and I don't know if it'll be 10 years, I don't know if it'll be 50 years, I don't know if it'll be 100 years, I don't know if it'll be 500 years, but it seems to indicate that we're getting really close to it happening, and I would think it'd be sooner, not later. Now, one also prophesied is that you can tell when you're in the end days when there'll be a one world religion as well. I right, turn back to Revelation 13, and in Revelation 13, it talks about this in verse 8. It says, in all, A-L-L, what's that spell? Okay, everybody, everybody that dwells upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of the Lamb of Life, slain from the foundation of the world. So here's where you get your one world religion. And everybody who is not a believer will become a follower of this one world religion, the Antichrist will be worshipped. So he'll be the one world dictator, but he'll also be the one world religious leader. And a lot has been happening to bring us toward a one world religion. Now, where does the one world religion come out of? Turn in your Bibles back to Revelation 17, and it tells us in verse 9, here's the mind which hath wisdom, discernment, the seven heads, the one world government, our seven mountains, Rome, on which the woman sitteth. Now, what woman? That's verse 1 of chapter 17, and he uses the terminology referring to a false religious system, and he calls it the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Now, it is a religious fornication where? They are involved in a false religion and they're praying to the Antichrist. Now, where's it supposed to come from? Rome. What major religion is now located in Rome? The Catholic Church. Catholic means universal. But even beyond that, you have this. Back when Pope John Paul II was alive, he met with leaders from over a hundred different religions. And they met in a place also with seven hills. Now, what city around here is called the city of seven hills? San Francisco. And so he met in San Francisco with over 100 different religious leaders. And he was standing, they were sitting, and the whole purpose was they were looking to him as the one world religious leader. And so they were talking about bringing all religions together under the umbrella of Rome. It's later than you think. Have you ever seen those bumper stickers that say coexist? And they have a little emblem from each different kind of religion with each letter, and it's on purpose saying, let's bring all these religions together, and a lot is happening to bring us toward the end days. Now, there also will be a one world money system. All right, our currency. Turn back to Revelation 13 and verse 16. Now, this is where you've heard of the mark of the beast. All right, it says, 
And he causeth all, A-L-L, -L, what's it spell? All, both small and great. This is why we say one world. He causeth all, small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell unless he had the mark. The name the beast, the number of his name. Here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is 603 score and six, or 666. Now, there's been a lot taking us toward this. Now, I remember years ago being in Williamsport, Burg, Williamsburg, uh, Virginia. And so there was an advertisement where you could come to a meeting where they were unveiling some new technology. It was called uh, uh, Smart Car Technology. And so with the Smart Car Technology, the vice president of the company would announce what it is, and if you wanted to invest in it, you could. So I attended that because I wanted to hear about the technology. And he said, I hold in my hand what looks like a credit card, but it's not a credit card, it's a smart card. And now we all got one in our wallet, right? He said, it looks like a credit card, but in the bottom corner, there's a little chip, and this little chip is going to be used for financial transactions. And he said, soon, <clears throat> nobody will be using paper money, everybody will be using a chip worldwide. And this little chip is going to totally become a one world financial system. Now, since then, we can see us moving that way. And there's so many different things. And it says that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark of the beast or the chip. Now, I think about some of the things that have developed recently in our last couple of years. No man may buy or sell unless he have a mask. No man can walk into my restaurant and buy or sell from my food unless he has a vaccine. No man can go to work and get a job to make money to buy or sell unless he has a vaccine. No one, and I'm not saying the vaccine was terrible. You can have a different opinion on it. But I am saying that we are very much moving toward controlling who can buy and who can sell and who can't buy and who can't sell. And it's all bringing us toward this one world currency. It really is. I remember going into Walmart and I saw this cash register and this cash register said, no cash, card only. And so I said to the lady, why do they have this card only thing? And she said, it's for COVID, it's COVID. So then over here, you could use cash just right over here. I said, so why can we use it over there, but we can't use it over here? It's just COVID. Stop the spread of COVID. I said, well, using cash spreads COVID? Yeah, people touching it. So I said, so then you don't care if these people die, but you want these people to live. Is that what you're trying to say? She says, I don't know. That's what they just say is COVID. All right, now what is really going on? What is really going on is we are moving toward a cashless society and no one will be able to buy or sell unless they have it. Now, the man went on and he said something about a bearer chip, and he said also something about a that smart chip. And when he did, he asked anybody any questions. Somebody raised their hand and said, is it possible for this chip to be implanted in human beings? And there was a nervous ripple of laughter. And then he said, I know why you're laughing. You're wondering if this is the mark of the beast. <clears throat> and he said, I attend a Southern Baptist church. I am a Southern Baptist deacon. I know exactly what the Bible says about the mark of the beast. Now the answer is, yes, this chip can be implanted in people. He said, that's why I am voting to keep it in a piece of plastic. But it is definitely moving toward that. So we are very close to this one world system. How many have ever heard of the Davos movement? Okay, you've heard about it. The Davos movement is there were 750 leaders from more than 90 countries uh, that got together with the European Central Bank. Uh, the world 
uh, Economic Forum, Charles Schwab, who's the leader of it, said, the pandemic is a great opportunity to reset the world. And what he's trying to do is by 2030 to have everybody become part of a one world economic structure. And it's later than we think. Now, these things are indications, and there's a lot more that we could talk about. The green transformation, the redesign of economics, the digital transformation where everybody has this 5G stuff now. I've got a 5G thing. But you know what's amazing with the 5G? Google. They tell me, you want to see your Google map? So I push a button. It tells every city I stopped at in 2022. Just because my phone was in my pocket. And all of this is part of uh, our transformation to the Bitcoin and things like this. It's a transformation so that they can shut it down if they don't like who you are and what you're doing. It's not a conspiracy theory. Now, all I'm simply saying is, if you're here today and you wonder, is there anything to the Lord's return? There really is. And is there anyone to it being very soon? Yes, it very much, there's much evidence for it. Now, that's the valid argument that Jesus is coming back. But I want to give you the invincible argument. Take your Bibles back here, and I want you to look at 2 Peter 3, where we started, and then we'll close. i not close, but we'll move to the final point, 2 Peter 3, though, right now. Here is the value, valid argument. There are signs, but then here's the invincible argument. We have God's word on it. We have God's word on it. Look at what it says in 2 Peter 3, 1. The second epistle, beloved, and I'll write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful, not negligent, not flippant about, but be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. And what was that that they spoke? That a Messiah is going to come and he's going to set up a thousand year reign called the millennium. So all of this is in the word, and I can give you a lot of scripture that says he's coming again. The valid argument, signs. The invincible argument, we have the Bible that tells us it's going to happen. Now, why does God put this in the Bible? Look at verse 9. The Lord is not slack or weak concerning his promise, as some may count slackness or weakness. Like he's not like unable to do this. But he says, he's long-suffering toward us. We're not willing that any should perish in the tribulation period, but that all should come to what? Repentance. So the reason God's put this in the Bible is for those of you that kind of wonder if there's anything to it, so you don't have to go through the tribulation. You can see evidences, and you can say, hey, I want to be saved. Now, we looked at the statement, I will come again, number two, the support, but let's look at the significance, and this is why this should affect us, okay? Now, if you've been saved, I know some of you boys have been saved. Make sure of it this week. You're not going to go through the tribulation. You'll be going to heaven. You'll be taken out in the rapture. But if you're not saved, here's what the Bible says will happen. And just like the one world government, just like all these other things coming together, this is going to happen. And all God has to do is say, light, and light came into existence. Let there be firmament, and it came into existence. And all God I have to say is, let the tribulation fall, and it will begin. All right, now here is an introduction to the tribulation. Let's look in your Bible at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians 5, and God introduces the tribulation period by comparing it to a lady having labor pains. A lady having labor pains. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 3. It says, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Now, I've never had a baby, but I have seen three babies born. They call me that, okay? 
Now, how many of you ladies have had a baby before? Okay, I know you have. I know you have. Okay, you have. And okay, right, obviously. Now, if you've had a baby, I've never had one, but I have seen three babies born, and I think I understand what labor pains are like because I've seen it three times. But I'm going to ask you if you think I understand. I think there are three phases to labor pains. All right, the first phase, they start bad. How am I doing? Okay, second phase, they get worse. Pretty good. And then third phase, they end unbearable. That's when you want to kill your husband. Okay. Yeah. So here's the tribulation, okay? All right, now, here's the way it unfolds, and we won't be able to go through it all, but I'm just going to give you the idea. It starts off with seven seal judgments. It gets worse with seven trumpet judgments and is unbearable with seven bowl judgments. And we're going to skim through them so you can see what the Bible says will happen if you are left behind. And hopefully you won't want to be left behind. All right, let's look at Revelation chapter 6. And it is the beginning of the labor pains, and it is seven seals. Now, just so you can understand where we're going, let's go in cartoon mode. And in cartoon mode, you can do anything. Like you can make me have a beard like your dad, okay? You can just do it. Tell if there's got a beard, okay? In a cartoon, you could draw me with huge bulging muscles. That would have to be a cartoon, okay? You could... You could do anything. Now imagine that cartoon, there's a book, and the book has seven chapters to it. And each chapter is sealed shut with some kind of a seal, a wax seal. And then the Lamb of God comes, who is Jesus, and he breaks that seal, and he opens up that chapter, and out comes a judgment, and falls on the earth. He opens a second, and another, and another, until the seventh one, get this in the cartoon, when the seventh seal is open and that seventh chapter is open, out of that seventh chapter comes seven trumpets in your cartoon. <laughs> and then an angel picks it up and blows trumpet number one. Out of the bell of the trumpet comes a judgment on the earth. And the second, the third. And then when the seventh trumpet is blown in our cartoon, out of the bell of that shoots seven bowls. Maybe like you would have cereal in. Or bowls could also mean like a vase that you might pour water with. But out shoot seven bowls. <laughs> and angels stand in a line, and they hold it up like this with steam coming out. God says, angel number one, pour out your wrath on the world that's rejected my son. And the wrath comes. And this is how it goes. The seventh seal is the seven trumpets. You get it? And then that seventh trumpet opens up into the seven bold judgments. So let's skim through these. We're not going to be able to get them all, but it will be kind of an exciting ride. I right, look at Revelation 6 and verse 3, where we have the beginning, and verse 2, where we have the beginning of the uh, sealed judgments, the beginning of the tribulation. And this is when the Antichrist, I believe, becomes the one world dictator. Right, it's in verse 2. And I saw him behold a white horse. He that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now he has a bow, but he does not have an arrow. A crown is the idea of he gets power. And this is where the Antichrist gets the one world dictatorship. And the world will give him the control of the world. Now, do you think the world is ready to have a one world dictator? I know it sounds a little bit crazy, but I think the world is ready for one world dictator. How do I guess that? How about this? How about we just had COVID and everybody in the whole world, regardless of who they were and what they thought, said whatever Fauci says, we will do. The man was almost a one world dictator. Now we are so ready if we could just have another pandemic and one guy steps up and says, I know how to fix it. We will say, do it. And so we are very close to this one world dictator and with 160 nations, 130 nations in that international criminal court, if he was in charge of that and they started pressing in on everybody else, he would be in charge of the world. So there will be a one world dictatorship, but we'll give him that position. Now, 
There'll be a short-lived peace, but then get this, guys, if you're in your teens and the tribulation comes now, a few years after that, there will be a one-world war. It'll be bigger than World War I. It will be bigger than World War II because it'll affect the entire earth. I right, notice verse 4. There went on another horse that was red, and power was given thereon to take peace from the earth that they should kill one another, and it was given to him a great sword. So they're going to have war worldwide. Now, as a result of world war, there will be, number three, a world famine. All right, look at verse six. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny. See thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Now, what's that jargon, a measure wheat for a penny? In Bible days, a penny was a day's wage. But with that penny, you could buy eight measures of wheat. But in the tribulation, you'll only be able to buy one. Now, what's that mean? If you could buy eight and now you can only buy one, okay, eight pairs of shoes, girls, now you can only buy one pair of shoes for that same amount of money, that means 800% inflation. Now, here's your application. Let's say you bought a can of Diet Coke and you paid a dollar for it. Tomorrow, you go to the same machine to buy a can of Coke, you pay $8 for it. Let's say you paid $100 for your grocery bill this week. You go to the grocery store next week, you pay $800 to get the same bag of groceries. You buy gasoline, it's $4 a gallon, you think you got a good deal. You go the next day and you're paying $32 a gallon. How are you going to feed your family with an $800 a week grocery bill. So this is the kind of thing that shortly after the tribulation period will happen, and then the Bible says the next seal, there'll be one-fourth of planet Earth will die in one night. Now, I don't know how they're going to do it, but God somehow is going to let it happen where 1.3 billion people will die in one night. Now, how's the world going to smell with, with 1.3 billion bodies dead in one night? You can't bury that many. I was in Haiti after the earthquake in 2010. There were 230,000 people dying. When I went there, smell. Why? You can't bury 230,000 bodies very quickly. And I'm not trying to be morbid, but what's it going to smell like with 1.3 bil uh, billion uh, dead in a night? Now, it's going to be tribulation. That's why it says that. There'll be in verse 9, the fifth seal. There'll be more death. Verse 12, I want you to see the sixth seal, and that's beginning at verse 12. And I beheld when he opened the sixth seal, and all there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of here, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree cast her thread, timely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Now, don't make this up because I don't need anybody to make it up. Just be honest. Have any of you ever seen the news talk about stars starting to hit our planet or a big meteor sitting on our planet? Anybody seen anything like that? You have, and you have, and you have even. Okay. Now, science, I read an article from National Geographic magazine that said very soon, scientists have charted nearly 500 large meteors or stars that they they expect will hit our planet or be close enough they could hit our planet within the next 26 years. Now what God said 2,000 years ago is in the tribulation period, stars from heaven will fall into the earth. Not all of them, but some of them. And one meteor can do a whole lot of damage. Now, then you move on to Revelation chapter 8, the second part of the labor pains with the seven trumpets. All right, now the first is in verse 7. The first angel sounded and the file followed hail and fire mingled with blood and they were cast upon the earth and a third part of the trees was burned up and a third part of the trees was burned up and all the green grass was burned up. So God says in the tribulation, it's going to rain fire and it's going to rain blood. And it's going to burn up a third of all the trees and all the grass will burn 
and in time it will be able to grow back grass but not the trees now what happens when you lose a third of all the trees in the world you're going to lose a lot of oxygen in the world and then on top of that it says it rains blood now somebody says that can never rain blood let me remind you god turned water into blood in Moses' day okay and let me remind you this if God said, let it rain water, and it rained water, why do you think God couldn't say, let it rain blood, and it'll rain blood? Mm -hmm. Take your chances. But I wouldn't do that. Now, then, it goes on, and it says that a third of the seas are going to turn to blood, a third of the fish will die, a third of the ships are going to sink, and that's in verse 8. And if you think about stars falling into the sea, that can also make a pretty large tsunami. And a tsunami could flip a pretty big boat. All I know is I don't know how God's going to do it, but he's going to send judgment on the earth. And then I want you to notice verse 12, and we'll just look at that fourth trumpet. It says, The fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, the third part of the stars says a third part of them is dark, and the day shall not a third part of it, and the night likewise. Now, there are 24 hours in every day. 24 divided by 3 equals what? Eight. You got it. Now, so eight hours of every day that the sun normally shines, okay, sun goes up 7 a.m. maybe, and stays up to like almost 7 p.m., am I right? Something like that. So for eight of those hours, those 12 hours, where it's normally sunlight, it's going to be pitch dark. I think personally it'll be so dark, you won't be able to see your hand in front of your face. I don't think you'll be able to see light with a flashlight. Eight hours of every day, so dark, you won't see anything. And that brings fear. But on top of that, I'll just give this, and I'm going to have to quit on this and just finish up because I don't want to abuse your time. There's so much more here. But I am even surprised I'm preaching on this, except, well, in a way, I'm not surprised. It's just so heavy. But I want you to think about this. Look at Revelation 9, where you look at the fifth trumpet. It says, this will happen. Now, how many do you believe that, I asked this in school today, how many really do believe that there are such things as demons? Okay, I believe that there are. Now, I don't look for a demon everywhere I go, but I have run into a few of them. I have one might sit. No, I'm only kidding. All right, now, but I honestly have seen some. I've not seen them. I've seen people with them. I've been to Haiti 10 times. Of course I've seen them, okay? Now, this says that there'll be these demonic beasts that are now not on earth, but are going to come on earth. And just like demons, there are some demons that are in hell and are not even allowed out. They're in chains of darkness. Maybe these are what they are. But they'll be temporarily released during the tribulation period. Some of these beasts that are in the, the, the bottomless pit. All right, now notice that and I'll explain it. All right, look at Revelation 9 and verse 1. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet. There's the second phase of the labor pains. And I saw a star fall from heaven under the earth. And to him was given the key to the bottomless pit or hell and he opened the bottomless pit and there he rose a smoke out of the pit that's the smoke of a great furnace and get this the sun and air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit so God opens up the bottomless pit and smoke bellows out now if you open up hell where there's a lot of fire do you think that there'll be some smoke there and so you open it up, and I don't know if it's in one place or several places that the bottomless pit's going to be open, prophesied in Scripture, but there'll be smoke coming out, and it'll cover the whole earth, and I think it'll probably take about eight hours to dissipate. Maybe this is how it happens. But what comes out of the smoke is a scary thing. It says in verse 3, And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Now, usually, locusts will eat plants, green things. 
but not these locusts. You know what they're going to eat? People. Now they're going to feed on them. They're not going to kill them, but they're going to torment them for five months by eating on their flesh. Notice what it says in verse four. It was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seed of God in their foreheads, those who are not saved. To them it was given that they should not kill them. They're not going to kill them. But that they should be tormented five months. How long? Five months. And her torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. Now what do these beasts look like? Verse 7 through 10. The shapes of the locusts were like the horses prepared for the battles. On their heads were crowns of gold. Their faces were like men. Hair like a woman. Teeth like a lion. Iron chest. Wings. And a tail like a scorpion. And they latch on and sting people. And the pain is the pain of a scorpion in the last five months. Now imagine... If you are saved, you're not going to be in it. So you don't have to go home and have nightmares and say, what happens to me? You're not going to be in it. But if you're not saved, it might sound like something that is impossible. You know what? It's no more impossible than you going to hell in your sin. God says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. And get this. God says, I do want you to go to hell. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth should not perish, but have everlasting life. And it's also true that if you do not prepare and make peace with God, you will go through the tribulation, and these beasts will be part of your future. Now, the way that it happens, God opens up the bottomless pit, and it's so dark because of the smoke. And just imagine if it's so dark because of the smoke, try breathing in that kind of smoke. So people will be struggling <coughs> for every breath for eight hours. And then all of a sudden in the darkness, you hear wings. I can never over exaggerate how bad it's going to be. But imagine in darkness, struggling for every breath, you hear <coughs> And you can't see them, but you know it's one of these demonic beasts. You can't see them, but they can smell you. So you turn and you run to get away, but the wings get louder and faster. <coughs> and out of the darkness you hear, and they latch on, sting you, and they do not let go for five months. Anybody want to go through the tribulation? Now, there's so much more we haven't even gotten halfway through. But I do think we need to begin to bring this to a conclusion. Take your Bibles back to where we started, 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3. Now, why does God put this in here in the Bible? When it's so ugly. Right? It's just like this. Why does God talk about sin when it's so ugly? Why does God talk about hell when it's so ugly? All in the Bible. Is it because God's so mad that he wants everybody to burn in hell? Is that why God put that in the Bible? No. He put it in the Bible because he doesn't want people to go to hell. And somebody says, Jesus is sending everybody to hell. I want to correct that thinking. Jesus isn't sending anybody to hell. He's trying to keep people from going there. And so here is what the Bible says, John 3, 16, that whosoever believed in him should not perish. John 3, 17, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. Not so you would be condemned, but that the world through him might or would be saved. Matthew 1, 21. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. Why? He shall save his people from their sin. So you need to be saved if you've not been saved. Okay? Now look at 2 Peter 3 again in verse 9. This is straight Bible. 
The Lord is not slack or weak, or unable to perform his promise. As some men count slackness. Ah, oh, it's been 2,000 years. And they mock it and say, you don't believe that junk, do you? Well, when I see a one world government, a one world currency, a one world monetary system coming together, I think, you know what, I think I do kind of believe this stuff. Just like the Bible said it would happen, it's coming together. All right, the Lord is not weak or slack concerning his promise, but is long-suffering, patient toward usward. Why? Not willing any should perish, but that all should come to what? Repentance. And now here's what repentance is, in case you don't know what it means. What it technically means is change your mind. Okay, girls, I know what you're thinking. I don't know where you're thinking. I know. I don't even know if you're thinking. You're females, okay? <laughs> but I do know this. All right? I do know this. Teenagers are not all, all the time all in believing the Bible because they've got everybody saying it's not true. But listen, did I make it up? 2,000 years ago, it said there'd be a one world government in the city of Seven Mountains, and it's happening. One world currency, and it's happening. And there's so many fulfilled prophecies. Even when you go to Jesus, the first time he came, did you know it said that he would be born in Bethlehem, Ephrata, 700 years before it ever happened? Did you know that it said he would be beaten with stripes? The cat of nine tails, a thousand years before, 700 some years before it ever happened, and it happened. Did you know that the Bible said that he would be sold for 30 pieces of silver? And that's in the book of Zechariah, and it happened. And you can't find one prophecy that it said would happen that didn't happen. And there are over 300 of them. Can you get 300 out of 300 right that's going to happen a thousand years from now? And there's only one way that this could have happened is there had to be somebody who gave these prophecies who could really be around and make it happen a thousand years later. And that would be Jesus. He gave us our Bibles. Now, here it is. It says these things are going to happen and God doesn't want you to go through it. Some will believe it. Some will not believe it. But those who do not believe it will perish in the tribulation. Left behind. And we'll go through the tribulation period. Where are you going to be? In here, or are you going to be left behind? And when you see evidences for it, you got to realize I got to deal with this thing. Now, God also wrote this to us as believers. Okay, I want you to notice a couple of things He says as believers, and then we'll be done. Now look at Second Peter three and verse fourteen. Wherefore. Beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, beloved of those who are born again, and as I preached the very first sermon in Sunday school, that God loves us so much, right? Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, we believe he's coming again, just as he promised, be what? Diligent. Okay, don't be lazy as a Christian. Don't be lazy about God's work. Get at it. Stay at it. Stay at it. Even in good times, even in bad times, stay at it. Stay at it. Be diligent. Because the day is going to come when we can't do this stuff for people anymore. And you know what I think? If I can get one more person instead of heaven and hell, if I live for 25 more years and one more person in heaven and hell because I stayed at it, it's going to be worth it. But I'm praying that I'll see a lot more than one. And I've actually even prayed for some of you that you see a hundred people saved in your life. And I believe it can be done. Okay? So be diligent because the night comes when we cannot be diligent anymore. It'll be all over. So do your best. Stay at it. Don't quit. Sometimes hard times. Sometimes easier times. Sometimes exciting times, sometimes just pushing through. But we stay at it because we know what we know, we do what we do. Because we know what we know. Now, back here, you don't have to turn there, but it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Now, how many of you have ever been, how can this be comfort? The tribulation is coming. People are going to go through the tribulation period. Stars going to hit the planet. A beast is going to come. It's got the tail of a scorpion. It will sting you. And the pain will last. It's going to rain fire. It's going to rain blood. 
billion people are going to die in one night. And then go, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, how would that be comforting? Here's the way the comforting is. The comforting is that if we're saved, we're not going to go through it. Now, that doesn't mean we're not sad about others, but we're not going to go through it. How many have ever been on a plane where there's been bad weather, turbulence and stuff? I was on a plane. I was on my way up, and it was a terrible, terrible storm. I mean, we're rocking 20 miles down, 20 miles up. I don't know how many miles. We're moving around, and we're all thinking we're going to go down. I started quoting, yea, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. That stewardess was scared to death. So I was over there trying to comfort her. And as I was on that plane, the big one, I could, from the back where I was sitting, see this plane go this way, and the back of it where I was was going like this. Then it went this way, and then the front went like this. It was twisting back and forth. I'm thinking, we're going to snap in two. And you know what? That gave me some confidence that these planes were pretty strong. So I don't get scared anymore in turbulence. But anyway, I thought, we're going down. We are not going to live after this one. So I'm quoting this, and then the guy that I was preaching for said, you know, I was on a plane yesterday, and you know what? It was so bad, I thought we were going down. I said, I was quoting, he said, yeah, I was quoting the Bible too. Now, when you're on that terrible plane, and there's a terrible turbulence, here's where I'm going with this. How many of you have ever gone up above the clouds and looked at the clouds from the top? That's beautiful. Right? Yes. Now, when all of this tribulation is going on down here, if you're a Christian, you're going to be taken up above the clouds and above the storm and all we will see because of not who we are, but because of who Jesus is and his plan to save us before the judgment, we're not going to have to go through it. And that's something to comfort each other with. And there's so much comfort in Christ including tribulation. Now, tribulation could be like when my dad died, my dad shot himself when I was a kid. You didn't know that. My dad died, shot himself. 12 days shot him. You can say I was weak, but I needed some help. And my mom said, this isn't the time to get bitter at God. This is the time we need God. We did just fine. Okay. I don't care what your problem is. You tell, tell me your problem. I'll tell you something about Jesus that can comfort you in it. Okay? But this application is we will not go through the tribulation period. <clears throat> Praise God for that. So if you don't know you're going to heaven, you may not understand it all, but I hope I've given you some things where you can believe it's going to happen and you have got to prepare to meet God. Let's bow our heads and we'll have a word of prayer. Now, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed for privacy, I would like to ask, how many of you know for sure that you're going to go to heaven? You have a Bible reason why you know your sins are forgiven, and there's no question that you have been saved by your faith in Jesus. Would you slip up your hand if you're sure you've accepted Jesus? You are not exaggerating. You're not pretending. All right, thank you. You can put your hands down. I saw some that could not raise your hand and didn't, and I appreciate your honesty. I appreciate the honesty of those who could raise their hand and did. But lying won't help you a bit. It will not get you up to heaven at all. So don't pretend. Now, so here's what I want to ask. Is there anybody here who would say, Brother Mike, I may not know everything what you're saying, understand it all, but I do understand that there is such a thing as sin, I'm guilty. And there must be common sense, a judgment for sin. So I am a candidate for God's judgment. And the Bible says that that would be hell and that would be the tribulation. It's a guarantee though, God doesn't want you to go through that or hell. And that's where Jesus comes in, where he died to take care of you and to save you. So here's what I want to ask you. Is there anybody here, maybe you don't understand all, but you know you don't want to go to hell and you don't want to go into tribulation. And you say, I know I'm a sinner. I don't know I'm saved and I want to be and I want help. I will not embarrass you, but I'd like to pray for you. 
And I won't say where you're sitting, but I'd like to pray for you and invite you to get help, but we don't force. So is there anybody like that? I'm not sure I'm saved, but I don't want to be left behind. I don't want to go to hell either. Pray for me. I recognize I'm a sinner and I want help. If that's you, just kindly, just slip up your hand. I'll see it. Enough I see it. You put it right back down and I will include you in a prayer. Anyone like that? I don't know I'm going to heaven, but I see there's something to this thing. And I want help. I don't know I'm saved, but I do know I'm a sinner. And I'm probably going to hell. And I don't want to do that. You're either going to heaven or hell. Where do you think you're going? So anybody like that? I don't know I'm saved, but I don't want to go to hell. And I think I'm probably going to hell. And I want hell. Okay, if anybody here dies and goes to hell, it'll be because you chose not to come to Jesus. Now, is there anyone who would say, Brother Mike, I do know I'm saved, but I haven't really been as faithful and trying to witness like I should. Because our time is running out to share our faith. I need to be busy at the work of God. Maybe that's church attendance and service that way. Maybe it's witnessing. And if you would say, I need to be busy at the work of God because I got to push through even when things are tough. And sometimes it's hard, but I just want to push through, be faithful in good times and bad times so I can be faithful to the end and hear, well done, good, faithful servant. That's what I want to be. Pray for me. I need to step up my dedication level to the things of God and to Christ. If that's you, just lift up a hand. Okay, good, 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 good. Great, wonderful. Amen. Now, I'm going to ask the pianist to come, and I don't want to force anybody, but I do want to invite, and I think it's always good for our souls, even if you feel a little awkward doing it, it's always good for our souls if there's someone that you want to pray that you could win them to Christ. I'm going to invite you to just come and kneel at the front and pray for him while she's playing in a little bit. If you want to say, i got to step up my dedication to God, I'm, I want to be used by God. I'm going to invite you, if you want, to slip forward and pray either on the steps or on the front pews. And if someone's in your way, they'll move. And I just encourage you, you can pray at your seat, but I think it might be really good if you came for your soul. And if that's you, as she begins to play, why don't you just stand up and come? Maybe somebody else will come with you. Let's stand together and pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we spent in your word. We know, Lord, that it is true. Help us, Lord, not to leave here unchanged, but that we would be more dedicated to your service while our time here is very, very short. Help us, Lord, to invest our lives into your purposes. In your name, amen. amen. You are dismissed. Amen. amen.
anybody would like Becky's artwork, it's on the back table. And what comes in, we use for missions. 